Hey, ladies and gentlemen, how are we doing tonight? Welcome. Thanks for coming to the American Writers Museum. Um, I'm going to ask for a quick show of hands. How many of you have never been here before? Shame on you. <laughs> just kidding. Thank you all for coming out tonight. We are glad you are here. So I'm just going to make a quick introduction. Part of our mission at the American Writers Museum is to explore the influence writers have on our culture. And tonight we're joined by one of the most versatile and admired writers in the country, the author of more than 40 books whose work has been translated into 23 languages worldwide. Walter Mosley's work has won an O. Henry Award, a Grammy, and Penn America's Lifetime Achievement Award. Writing in Lit Hub, Walter Mosley offered this profound observation on our current cultural moment. I identify with the belief that there exists a history out there just beyond the reach of our powers of cognition, and I believe that a lie is a lie. That if you coexist with a population that helped to build your house, your culture, your music, a population that helped to raise your children and fine tune your language, and you deny that culture's impact on who you are, then your knowledge of history will fail you and the past will devour you and your children. If you deny your past, your future will be a detour around your fondest hopes and dreams. So that is the power of Mr. Mosley's writing and that is why he is here tonight. And so he recently wrote a novel about a deconstructionist historian, John Woman, was long -listed for the, which was long listed for the Andrew Carnegie Medal for Excellence in Fiction. And reviewers called it taut, riveting, and artfully edgy. He'll be joined tonight to talk about the book by the American Writers Museum Program Committee Chair, Mr. Ivan Kane. So please welcome Walter Mosley. Oh. Walter, you're here touring with your new book, uh, John Woman, which I'll hold up. And it's available for purchase in the back. I hope you'll all take advantage of the opportunity. And uh, the way this is going to work, I'm going to ask Walter some questions about the book, a few questions about his broader career, and, and, uh, and, and a few sort of wild card questions. But we're going to leave a lot of time for audience questions, so I want you all to think about the questions that you might have. So uh, Walter, I understand you worked for more than 15 years on John Woman. I think it was 20 years, and and yeah, I I, I started writing. You know, it, it, it's um, you know, I don't know. You know, America is, is dominated by capitalism. It's an interesting thing, you know, because people know it, but it, you, you don't feel it. Capitalism is is based on 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 production, and and production is based on the production line. And the production line is like putting the left front tire on the Pinto, right? You put the left front tire on the Pinto. That's what you do. And, and so you don't come in one day and say, well, today I think I'm going to put in the air conditioning. They go, no, 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 no. You got, you got to get, get a whole new education and a whole new classification in order to be able to put in air conditioning. You put in a left front tire. Now, my left front tire is a mystery. So I write mysteries. You know, I mean, I've written 57 books, published 57 books, and only 27 of them are crime books. But people still seem to think that the only thing I can write is a mystery. And so I, so I had to work really hard on trying to, to finish a book that I knew would work on a, on a literary thing. Because what I did was, you know, I was in a PhD program in, in political theory, which is basically philosophy. And it turns out to be the, basically the philosophy of history. Um, but nobody knew that and nobody believed it. And, you know, so even once I'd written the book, even after the 20 years were over, and I wrote the book, I figured out what the ending should be, uh, 17 publishers refu refused to publish my book. One guy said, too intellectual. That was it. Didn't even put a period at the end. Just said, too intellectual. <laughs> One woman said, well, if you would like to come in, I could explain to you how you could make a novel work. And I was like, damn, you know. Anyway, go on. I, I, I kind of answered your question. Well, what changed then over the 15 or 20 years you worked on it? What do you mean what changed? Well, you, you mentioned you figured out an ending. I figured out the ending. That's the only thing that changed. I figured okay. out the ending. I said, oh, I see. You know, um, it, it, it has to end in a way that it, you, the, uh, the, the reader has to decide what happened. Like you, because that's the thing about deconstructionist history. My, my, my character is what I call a deconstructionist historian. Because you can never know what happened in the past. Everything you know about the past happens in the future. Think the past changes as the days go on. And, and, and so um, 
so my dis deconstructionist historian is a, is a guy who says, no, we don't know what happened. We can only gesture toward that. Okay. And, and it's a thing that makes everybody dislike him. Um, you mentioned you were rejected then for this novel. What, what, had you submitted it uh, years ago? Or, no, no, no. Or, only or, only or, after I finished it. When I found the ending, I started sending it out. And okay. they kept saying, no, no, no. Mm -mm. And really, honestly, they could make the money back. My publisher made the money back on this book by, by selling it to audiobooks. They made okay. the exact same sum that, <laughs> that they gave me from audiobooks. I'm like, so anybody could have done that, you know. Okay, okay. <laughs> it's like, it wouldn't have cost you no money. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, deconstructionist historian. I, 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 I had some trouble... Uh, with that, I had trouble making it out. Um, hmm. You're uh, uh, at one point the character uh, uh, creates history from a garbage pail. Yeah, and tell us about that. Well, you know, the, 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 any real historian will tell you the be the best way to understand her history is by a shopping list, because. If somebody's buying something, they really need it. They're not like going out to buy something for nothing. So I need, uh, you know, uh, three pounds of flour, two bananas, uh, you know, what, whatever the thing is that they need. You can pretty much follow what they're bringing in to to what they're doing. You know, like you, you, an architect could have a shopping list. Uh, you know, a housewife can have a shopping list. You know, uh, you know, guys going out hunting for the for the you know the weekend are going to have a shopping list. You know, and so it, it's real tangible things. And so, like, if you, if you, what John decides, if I look at this trash can once a week for the next couple of months, I'm going to have a really good idea of the structure of this town and of the people of this town and, and, and what they're doing and, and what they're discarding and what they're keeping and what they're losing. And, and, and so that was a, that was a thing that was a, a, a thing for him and, and for them. But you know the idea of, of deconstruction as history is, is is the problem is people think they know um, what they think they know what happened. They think they know. They don't, but they think they know. So, for instance, I, I'll start off by this. Just just for me to say, it's one of the things I say all the time nowadays. I don't believe in the existence of white people. You know, the notion of white people. I've never even seen a white person. You know, just to begin with. Nor have I really seen a black person. Never seen a yellow person. You know, there's some people I could, you could probably call them brown. You know, brown people. Most of us are kind of like brown people. But, 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 but the idea is that if there, there, there's, a, there's a, a group of people who call themselves white people for no other reason that they, than they want a foot up in the world. And, 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 you know, because otherwise you'd say I'm Irish or German or something like that. You know, it's like, you know, you'd have a cultural identity, not a color identity. But, but, but the idea of, of, of that has, is so uh, it, it influenced uh, what we call history that you have written history that leaves out all of the Chinese, all of the natives, all of the, the, the natives in Spanish, all of the African Americans certainly, leaves all those people out. And, but those people are part of the history. So if you say your history is something that has nothing to do with the people who actually built your fucking country, then what, what happens is, is that you strangle your own potential to know your history. And so the truth is gone, which is what we feel in America today. Nobody even believes in truth anymore because they've been strangled. On your website, you include an essay that, that you're tired of history being written by the winners. You know. Well, you know, I, I think that, you know, that's, that's the thing. The, the, the big thing is you, you win the war and you write the history. Right. You, you vilify the losers. Uh, you know, uh, Richard III is a great example of that. You know, and, 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 and you, 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 yeah. Now... I'm, I, the, the winners are always going to write history. Let's be clear. Like, so the historian's job is to, is to deconstruct what the winner wrote. That's the job. Okay. I mean, to, to talk about deconstruction. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he says that they were all good and these people are all bad. But, and then you look at you know, this and you look at that and you look at this and you, and you try to figure it out. You never figure it out. But you get as close as you can. Okay. Now, the, the protagonist uh, uh, who 
person who becomes to be known is John Woolman. Um, he's influenced by his father. His father is described as an autodidact, a self-taught man. Mm -hmm. um, is that based in part on your own father? Nope. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, you, you have a lot of autodidacts through your literature. Yeah, you know, I love Herman Melville. He's not a didact. You know, he just, you know, he was reading Shakespeare while he was writing Moby Dick, and you can really follow it right through. Like, you go, oh my God, oh, this is, you must have been reading Macbeth right here. <laughs> and here he is reading Lear. You know, it, it's, a, it's a kind of a, a, a wonderful thing. But also, and, um, if, you're, if you're not self-trained, you've been brainwashed. If you go to school, they just, they just teach you shit in school, you know? I mean, it's like, they teach you, well, listen, you know, like, like, I mean, there's a logic. You go to school, most people are working class people. I know Americans say they're middle class, but that's full of shit. They, and there's no middle class. There's about 8% about of America's middle class. The rest of the people are working class people. So they have kids. The, the kids are smart. The kids want to go to school. They tell them, well, never take a class where you're going to get less than a B. Uh, never take a chance in anything that you ever do. Never, always obey the rules and, you know, and, and, and always get those A's, always move forward. And you follow these kids moving forward. Now, they don't finish school till they're like 27. And, but they've been taught from the age of nothing to the age of 27 never to take a chance. So that means that they are not creative people. So you're an advocate for autodidacts. I, 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 wanna, I just want to say that if you, if, you, if you go to school, school is there to brainwash you. And that might be, you know, you might make more money, you might do better, but you won't know the truth, and you won't know that you don't know the truth. Now, uh, in the book, John Woolman uh, seems to me to be a, a follower of what I'll call the classic humanities, uh, we'll say dead white people, uh, yeah. Freud, Marx, Doc Men, I, I got Doc Men in there. There's, sure, there's, sure. There's, there, there are black people in it, you know, but yeah. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I've seen in some of your other works uh, some characters, some autodidacts, some, some are, 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 have, have formal training, but, but uh, they often also uh, refer to what I'll call the classic humanities. Now, the classic humanities are under fire um, uh, in a lot of places these days. Uh, where do you come out on that? Well, and at first, I, I, I would ask you, so what would they read if they weren't reading these books? Like, because you're saying it as well, if, well, as if well, it's a well, choice. Well, you know, today most people well, don't but, don't read. But, but no, but people that, don't but, read. That doesn't matter. That what, what what's uh, what's available? Yeah. And you know, listen, a lot of my books that you're talking about, I'm, I'm talking about Easy Rawls, 1940s, 1950s, 1960s. Not today. It's then. You know, uh, Leonid McGill was 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 trained in in, in revolutionary uh, uh, literature, for mm. instance. So it's not. Yeah. It wasn't classic. Uh, right. Easy Rollins, and then when you went to the library, uh, finding people like Doc Ben, for instance. Impossible. Uh, uh, find, you know, uh, so much of the work by so many of the people, you know, you might find Phyllis Wheatley, you know, I mean, honestly, you probably find Zora Neale Hurston. And, but, you know, and, and of course, my characters read those people. Mm -hmm. but, 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 but what's available to you becomes what's important. And, and who makes it available to you? The thing is, is these characters all find it on their own. They just start reading books. They you know, pick up books. They say, "Oh, this is a, looks like a good book," you know. And and, and they're reading the book. Um, now, of course, you know uh, uh, what, what's his name? Uh, Howard Zinn. You know Howard Zinn. You know does a wonderful alternative history of America. You know in which he talks about all those people that are left out of history. I think that's really important. It's really important to let people know that there are other notions of history. That and and so uh, so I, I agree with that. But, you know, I mean, listen, you can read, uh, you know, uh, Walden Pond. That's a great book. You know, it's a great book. And, and he's a free thinker, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, uh, and then you can read, uh, what's his name, uh, Whitman. You know, Whitman. You know, like, but that's the thing. You can read Whitman, but you can't talk about him being gay, you know. That, that becomes, so, like, there's, you know, if you, com if you open up Whitman wide enough, he's going to teach you everything you need to know. Usually it's kind of closed. I contain multitudes, as Walt said. 
Yes. Um, your main character, again, named John Woman, but, but there's a transformation. Uh, John Woman begins as a young boy named Cornelius Jones, who, who goes by CC. Uh, he briefly adopts another name, I think, as he's, he's entering college, and, and eventually self-adopts the name John Woman. Mm -hmm. uh, the name's kind of provocative. Can, can you uh, uh, give us the background of uh, why the main character here is called John Woman? No, I'm not going to do that, but... but. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll say, well, listen, you've got to read the book, right? I mean... I, <laughs> But, 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 but the thing is, is that it, 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 it is a, a, a really good example of, of what deconstructionism is, how he takes different pieces and puts them together in, in, in a new way. And, uh, and, and, it, and it all works, including the, the kind of sexuality in, in, the, in the name. Even that's a part of it. And so, I, I, you know, so, but, you know. You know, it's, 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 I, you know, I resist explaining you know, parts of my books because, you know, I mean, you know, yeah, he calls himself John Woman, right? You, you, when you figure it out, you go, oh, really? Okay. It'll make sense. It won't be confusing. I promise. Well, I, I agree. Um, I, I'll ask you one more interpretation question and, okay. and, and you'll probably decline it. Um, and, and I also want to be careful because... Uh, uh, the ending is a um, little mysterious, um, and we don't want to give it away. Uh, so I'll, I'll be careful here. Um, the, the number three seems to appear at key moments. Um, yeah, you know. <laughs> I'm thinking it does. Uh, like, like where? Well, okay, the, the beginning of the book, um, he, he kills the character with three blows, with, oh, with, with a third blow. Oh, yeah, that, that three, yeah. That's yes, that, that, that three. Yeah, that three. Um, and, and three, again, appears a couple times near the end of the novel. Yeah. So, uh, without revealing, it, it is, is, is that something we should uh, look at as a hint John Woman thinks of himself as a very um, uh, kind of intelligent uh, person who, who who lives in a real world that you can that can be understood. It's just that humans aren't sm smart enough to understand it. But he's also extremely superstitious because of his mother, mm -hmm. and I think that three comes out there the three comes out where it's he he can see the steps toward his own demolition but also he kind of realizes that he's a sociopath and that's a it's a, that's a very important subject to me and almost everything i write because you know Really, the successful people in our world are sociopaths. You got, you got to admit it. You know what I mean? <laughs> you don't want to admit it. You know, like you want to say, no, the, the good person who lives at the end of the block who always gives, you know, you know, lollipops to, you know, to children and grandmothers. You know, but no, it, it's the sociopath who makes it, especially in the system of capitalism, because capitalism, you know, supports the sociopathy. You know, that, you know, if the more you're willing to kill, you know, old people and widows out of apartment buildings, the more money you're going to make. You know, the more you raise the rent on people as fast as you can, the more money you're going to make. You know, the, 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 the cheaper, you know, I guess in World War II, uh, I mean, the Civil War, a guy was making boots uh, for the Northern Army and, a, and the, they were marching and the boots fell apart after one day. And they came back to him and said, you know, what the hell is wrong? We want our money back. He said, well, you don't understand. I made those boots for the cavalry. They're supposed to be in a horse. They're not supposed to be walking. You know, I just, you know, and it's just like, say anything, right? You know, and so, so, um, so anyway, so yeah, yes, I think that the three is his superstition. And it may have some basis in reality. Okay. Um, you were describing the classic so sociopath as, as the real estate developer, um, yeah, and I'm sorry, I know because you worked in detail. No, no, well, no, no, I'm going, I'm going somewhere else. Uh, it, it, it sounds like our, our president. No, it does sound like uh, our president, you know, and, you know, he wasn't actually the worst choice we had. Uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, we have a, we have a, we have a country 
in which, you know, our last president was an anomaly. You know, and and now we have, you know, a, a guy, you know, who like, you know, who, because people have lost faith, faith in truth, they they don't care that he's lying to them because they, because there's a sense of either I'm going to get what I deserve or at least I give me some revenge, you know, and I think that that's what's that's what's happening, you know, and of course on the other side there are people who don't understand that there are other people who need help who might be on the other side from you politically or whatever. I mean, there's a, it's a very interesting thing. Yeah. I'm going to turn to just a couple questions about your body of work and, and uh, a couple general questions and we'll open it to the audience. Um, you're, you're famous for your mystery series, uh, Easy Rollins, Leonard McGill, um, uh, Socrates Fortlow, Fearless Jones, others. Uh, uh, you recently, uh, one of your recent books featured Joe King Oliver, an, an ex-cop. Um, do, do you, will we see more of him? I, I don't know, actually. I, you know, I don't know. Uh, but it, it, you know, because I, I, I don't really think it out. I mean, somebody could come, listen, if somebody came up tomorrow and said, you know, I'll give you $100,000, write this next book, I'll do it. And, you know. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, it, it's like, sure, why not? You know, um, and I might write one anyway if you know if I feel you know if the if the urge you know if I feel the urge you know to write it. I've, I've been trying to do a television show on it, but you know it's very hard working with Hollywood. You know they have, you know they have things. You know, we went to a meeting, and I went with my I have a partner uh, Diane, who's like a, a Chinese uh, black Jamaican woman, and. <laughs> And we, uh, and there's these three guys, all of whom think they're white, and they're all five foot four, and they're all wearing the same suit, slightly different color, and they're all sitting there looking at us, you know, making decisions. It was the funniest thing. They're saying, well, you know, because, you know, the, the, the fun thing about the book is the daughter, because yeah, the daughter yeah, yeah. is, she, she is the thing that has maintained her father's sanity, but the daughter is not Veronica Mars. You know what I mean? But like these people are saying, well, maybe we could make a Veronica Mars. And I'm like looking at him going, you know, listen, you give me enough money, you can. I don't care. But that's not what I want to do. And, and you know, and, you know, and, and, you know, we tried to put a thing together, but it doesn't make sense. It would be okay to take the daughter and leave him out of it. But if he's going to still be there, it doesn't make sense. And it didn't. And so, you know, we went to pitch it a couple places, and they said, no, now we're going to pitch it some more places, and hopefully I have more to do with it this time. Uh, Devil with a Blue Dress was written by someone else. The book Carl was Frank. written by Carl you, Frank. but the movie yeah. um, written by someone else. But then uh, at least one other of your books was filmed. You wrote the screenplay. Always uh, outnumbered, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's, right. that's right. That's right. Cicely um, Tyson. Uh, now, uh, would you want to control the writing of the screenplay, or, or would you give away a property? Well, it to... depends. You know, like if somebody came up to me with a great idea and they could write the screenplay and they had all this talent, I, I don't mind them writing it. That that doesn't bother me. My control, you know, control in Hollywood has to do is if you produce or not, because only producers make money. If you start looking up people on the, you know, like a, like in Wikipedia, and they tell you how much they're worth, you know, if they're worth enough, and you you start comparing actors to producers. Producers always have more money. So, well, Bruce Willis got four hundred million dollars, but the guy who produces his movies, he got nine hundred million dollars. You know, it's like, like, wow, what happened? You know. So I, yeah, yeah, I like to be in control of the money. You know. Okay. And I would like the script to be good. So, is there any chance we'll see another Easy Rollins book? A book? I mean, I'm writing one right now called Blood Grove. Oh, great! Yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. That's okay. that's fun. Good. A um, uh, couple of general questions. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll put these together. Who do you read and who influenced you? Well, you know, I'll, I'll answer the influence question. You know, I mean, you know, like I read, I read everybody, but, and, and everything, you know. Um, influence is a great thing. Like if you guys like, like decide to start coming here more often or something, because I heard him say shame on you. Uh, if you decide to come here more often or you go somewhere else, and there are writers sitting in front of you. And you, you should ask and say, who influences you? Now, I want you to understand this person, every person except myself, is going to lie to you. Yeah. Every single one of them. 
young black woman sitting in front of you. She's just written a book about her life in Mississippi or something. And they said, well, who uh, influenced you? And she'll say, first, Phyllis Wheatley, because probably you don't know who she is. And then, then Zora Neale Hurston, because probably you do. And then Toni Morrison, Alice Walker, Edwidge Nanticott, Ntozake Shange, Sonia Sanchez, June Jordan. I'm just going to go on and on and on. All these extraordinary writers. But she's not telling you them because... She, they influence her. She's telling you them because they want, she wants you to compare her work to their work because who really influenced her was, uh, what's, oh God, what's, what's her name? The, uh, the mystery girl, Nancy Drew. Who really influenced her is Nancy Drew, right? She's a little black girl living across the street, you know, in the house this little girl always wanted to do, live in. And that's who influenced her because we're not in, and listen, if you, like, if you gave your eight-year-old daughter beloved, she'd come back to you and say, Mama, one of us got to die. Because, <laughs> you know, this is too serious. You know, a little, a little girl can't be reading. But, but your, the, your closest relationship to, to writing, to belief in writing, when you're a real kid reading, writing, reading, it, it almost doesn't even happen. It's like that world, you're seeing it, you know, play out in front of you by reading. That's how powerful, like, an early reader is. And, and those influences for me, like it was, um, you know, uh, uh, Jack Kirby right, drawing the Fantastic Four and Captain America, you know? It was my father who could, who could make anybody mad and laugh at the same time by telling a story. And my father by saying to me, uh, Walter, t tell me a story. It's about, it's about the, those black male heroes that, that, that I was surrounded by who took care of me, who protected me, who educated me when I was a child. The, that's the influence. You know, The influence is never writing. People come up to me and say, well, writing make readers. I'm saying, well, everybody reads. How come everybody ain't a writer? You know? <laughs> it's like, like it, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a notion. I mean, reading is a wonderful thing, and it's an important thing, but it doesn't necessarily make writers. You know? Reading is, you know, I mean, because a writer has a story to tell. You know, you, like you're raised in, in hip hop Chicago, you got a story to tell that's never been written before. You, can, you know, people, like, it'd be hard even to find the influence, you know, uh, but you're going to write that story if you feel it. Okay. You know, let's open it up to the audience. Okie doke. Um, I'll just ask you to raise your hand, and, and if we acknowledge you, if you could stand up and... and uh, yeah, there's a question over there. And, and we, we have the first one, a gentleman to our left. So the character for Lincoln, that you had in one paragraph, James uh, Ber Bergon? God, I, I really, what, what are we saying? What, what the, the character that you had in John Woman. Yeah. Yeah, paragraphs about Lincoln. Uh-huh. Uh, was that a real... No, no, I just made that up. Yeah, I just made it up. And, and, and John Woman, there's a, it, it, he, they, they want him to prove himself. And he, he came across uh, a, a letter that indicated that Lincoln had had a relationship with a prostitute who later had a son named Abraham. Who, who killed a guy in a carnival some years later. And, he, and he, you know, he could make his whole life on that, on that yeah. story. But he wasn't interested. He said, that's, you know, that's just you know, flummery. It's not, it's not real. It's not understanding the philosophy of history. It's, 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 it's uh, denigrating it. Yeah. Uh, next, right here, ma'am. John is an intelligent man. Yes. So why did he go to Florida? So your understanding of intelligence <laughs> is that we always do the right thing. <laughs> you know, I think it might be the opposite. <laughs> well, he didn't get caught, you know. That didn't, that didn't get him caught. And, and he felt, you know, and, and he was in love with that detective. He, he needed to reach out to her. And he really covered his tracks on that. I think that there was no way for her to find him. She knew he was still alive, but you know he was probably still alive anyway. You know, if he if he got caught, I would agree with you. But you know, but I think it goes all the way through to the end of the book. He he has that conversation with his you know his uh, his assistant in class, and he says, she says, well, why don't you just stop doing this? And he says, I can't. This is this is this is who I am. 
you know? And I think that that's a lot of us. A lot of us believe that our intelligence is going to save us. And it doesn't save any of us. Uh, next. Uh, Lovely, brother. Well, thank you. Um, my question really is about your fiction. I, I'm impressed with your breath. I mean, your breath is what you write. Kill a Johnny Cry, your revolutionary work, how to write a novel. So, and I thank you for writing a novel about a professor because I have to be one. And I'm not sure I'm a deconstructionist economist, but I'm an unconventional economist. So, the issue that most concerns me is what I perceive as kind of a war against young men of color. How can I get more of them into college and out of college to be successful? And you know, if you're in Chicago, you know, the home of Emmett Till and, and, and the brother who just got shot, Kwan. So, what are your thoughts on how I can accomplish that objective of helping out young men of color? Now, you know, to begin with, of course, I, you know, like, I'm, I'm not believing that I have the answer to that question. You know what I mean? It's like, that's a big question. And, you know, it, it's like, but, 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 I, but I'm going to use an example of one thing. And, then, and, and I believe that this one thing is the first building block on all the rest of the things to do. I'm going to start, you know, my, I, really it's true. It's, it's, I feel so silly at my age saying this, but my best friend is a guy named Paul Coates. Paul Coates... Uh, in the, in the 60s was the head of the Black Panthers of Baltimore. Later on, he started a, a, a press to publish books to send into prisons. Now he has a big black classic press been going on for 40 years. Uh, he gives all these books out, you know, all over the world, books by and about people of color. And his son, it happens to be ta Coates. So like, it's like, it's like, Everybody knows Tanahasi nowadays. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it, it's spelled Tanahisi, but it's pronounced Tanahasi. Uh, and 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 you know, all of Paul's children are upstanding members of the community. I mean, you know, Tanahasi is like a whole step beyond that, but but all of them are. But people will come up to me for years and they'll say, Mr. Mosley, how do I get my child to read? And I look at them and I say, well, do you read? And they say, well, I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about my kid. I say, yeah, I, I am too. Do you read? I say, you know, if, if you drink whiskey, drink cigarettes and beat your wife, that's what your kid's going to do, right? And if you sit down every day and you're reading a book and your little kid's looking at you reading that book, there's a good chance, not, it's not necessary. But you know, but I think that's where it's based. It's based in what we give to our children and, and what we teach them by who we are. And you know, sometimes you, know, you end up like Tupac Shakur, who also comes out of the Panther movement. You know? But I think, but even that's not a bad thing. You know? It's just like, it just scares you know, so-called white people. But, but, but I think that, that, that the real image starts to begin is like, how do we become the role models for the children who know us? Not children we don't know, but like children who know us. People say, oh, Uncle Dan. Hi, Uncle Dan. Say, hey, what you doing? Say, well, I'm reading this comic book here. You want to come read it with me? And they say, yeah, I'll read it. Say, well, what do you think about that? Well, you know, and then just that, that discussion is going to change that kid's life so deeply, you know? And, and, and it's not, you know, it's not, anyway, that's enough. Next question. Uh, there's a fellow with a hat in, yes. in, right there. Uh, time and place are obviously very important to your parents. I'm curious as to how you decide where and when to put them. Ball is obviously going to start at 50 years later in the field, more modern. Mm -hmm. How do you decide where and when? Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure I know the answer to that question. Yeah, it's like, because, you know, I, I just like writing, you know, like I'm, I'm this, this new one. I know it's 1969. I know he has his detective agency. Uh, 
I know he's still kind of overcoming the time where he almost died. And I just kind of follow him from there, you know? Uh, and, 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 and how you follow him becomes the things. In this new novel, Easy has just solved a problem for this very rich man. But the problem has gotten all of his money locked up, so he can't get to it. So he owes Easy $60,000, but he can't pay it. So what he does is he signs over his uh, Phantom 6. This is a very expensive Rolls Royce, 1968. He signs over his Phantom 6. And Easy's ecstatic. He's driving his, his Rolls Royce, you know? And anybody who knows L.A., like if you're going up La Cienega, you're in Los Angeles until you hit Wilshire. When you cross Wilshire, you're in Beverly Hills. He drives up to, you know, to Wilshire, you know, he's going to his new house, and he drives across, and, he's, and all of a sudden the, the, the lights are flashing behind him. And he went, oh, right. You know. <laughs> and he pulls to the side, and the, the policeman comes up, and he, and he says, uh, uh, a license and registration. And he said, well, excuse me, officer, I, I don't want to argue with you, but aren't you a Los Angeles policeman? And he says, well, I am. I said, well, we're in Beverly Hills. Uh -huh. And he said, but I can stop you if I'm in hot pursuit. And he said, hot pursuit of what? <laughs> he said, hot pursuit of a, a nigga that just sold a Rolls Royce. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, it's, so I find myself in places, you know. At first, he was just driving home, you know, but I realized everywhere he goes, the police are going to stop him, you know, and like, other thoughts, notions, ideas, minor criticism? Yes. So I'm a Chicago public schools librarian, uh -huh. and I work in middle school, uh -huh. and I've noticed that James Patterson co-writes with individuals that write middle grade and YA books, Yes. but we don't have any... Walter Mosley, middle grade, Easy Rollins for kids books. Well, you have 47, right? But they're adults. We need some no, 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 no. 47, no. Jackie. 47 is a young adult book. So we need some She just handed him the book. We need some more. We made a connection here. This is great. <laughs> we, you know, well, uh, there's a bookstore in, in Los Angeles called Essawan. Uh, they know me, call them. There are hundreds of those books that are being published by black people all over the country. And they, they don't make it to you, I know that. But they're there, they're out there. People are publishing, they're trying to distribute them. It's a difficult thing. The books are there. Any, uh, talk to Third World Press, uh, you know, Haki Marabuti here. Haki will give you lists and lists and lists of books that you could that that, that you can have. You know, uh, it's 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 mm -hmm. it's a very difficult it's a difficult thing. But the books are there, and and it's just like mine. I only wrote one, but forty seven is a good book. You know. <laughs> uh, let me take a question from the back, uh, the gentleman. You? Sir, yes. Is what? Raymond Alexander. Okay, yeah. Mouse. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Are you going to ever write a book where did I miss one of your books that's dedicated solely to? So, so you're going to write a book about mouse, yeah. just about mouse. Yeah. Okay. On what? Not power, uh, snowfall. Yeah. Um, uh, who knows about that? the second question is easy. Who knows? Like I always try to do stuff. People always ask me. I'm working on an easy roll in series now with somebody who might be able to do it. But I I, I don't know if that's going to happen. Uh, you know, you never can tell because you know it costs a lot of money to make those shows. And you know, and 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 once they make them, they want to change them so much. You know, they want to say, well, could it do this? Could it do that? Could it do this or that? You know, uh, what well, could easy be white or half white or you know? <laughs> Oh, my God.
can he have a white man locked up in his basement? But but no. But 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 but. The, you you wrote reason, that book. <laughs> I wrote that book, but not yeah. with easy. Not, not with easy. easy not now. with easy, right? There's no basements in California. Yeah. Um, but 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 the, but the problem uh, the problem with writing a book about Mao's is that Mao's is a sociopath. I mean, he's he's like a he's like a died in wool. So, so you you know you, you know you 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 kill it, eat it, or fuck it. That's his thing. I mean, he's not going to do anything else. And so. The problem is, is that it, 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 it's not an interesting book. You need, he's doing some very interesting things in uh, 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 Blood Grove. Very, Mouse is. Mouse is doing some very interesting things. And, uh, and, and Easy's getting scared because Mouse is changing. And that's something that never happens. Mm. Um, and so, so it's, it's kind of fun. But no, I'll never have him alone. No. Okay, we have one in front here. Um, I just want to say, my parents have been giving me your books since I was very young. Mm -hmm. My father gives me all of the academic stuff that takes... I can't get through. My mother started me with all Easy Rollins and all of the. Now, how old were you when she gave you Devil in a Blue Dress? Around the time the movie came out, she told me to. I, I don't. I don't care what time it was. I don't care how old you were. <laughs> I'm trying to think. I was still a teenager. Oh, okay. Yeah, a, a teenager. brave, a brave mother. Yeah. yeah. No, yeah. they did. And that's what I'm thinking about with everybody talking about um, young people reading. That my parents just gave me books, and when my friends came to my house, they were like, "Oh my God, I, I've never seen any uh, as many books outside of the library as here." So I think that's all it takes. But the only yeah. person whose stories I like compared to yours are my dad's. But he's an oral storyteller. Mm -hmm. You're written, and so I had to be here. I'm from the Virgin Islands. We don't get opportunities to see people like you. So I'm like, mommy. <laughs> Mm -hmm. so, yeah, and I, I think the only problem with the young kids reading are the adults that are not reading around them. And also, I think that it's really true. Like, for instance, the Socrates Fort Lowe stories, you know, always outnumbered, always outgunned. Those kind of stories, inner city kids, regardless of race, love them. Uh, 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 easy wrong. You give a look, you give a kid easy wrongs, and he and he could work with that. He could say, "Damn, all right," you know, because. <laughs> Because you know, yeah, I mean, you give you give an inner city kid catcher in the riot, and they just don't get it. They say, "I don't understand what's wrong with him. He he rich. He got a car, man. He could do anything. What he complaining about? You know, you know." And it's like, you know, but if you read, you know, it's outnumbered. When you know Socrates finds the kid who's killed a chicken, and he realizes he's actually killed a person at some point. You know, then, yeah, they see that. They say, "God, there's, there's no way out for him." But Socrates sees a way out. And that becomes that becomes the thing. Now, of course, these are books kids can read. I mean, you know, really, honestly, they could read them. A lot of people don't want to give them to kids because they say, well, you know, there's some sex in there. So, well, you know, the, your kids are probably having more sex than you are, you know. <laughs> so maybe, you know. Uh, next question. I, I love all those uh, turtles back there. Yeah, yeah. ma'am, right here. Yeah. Hard work. I, I don't feel it's hard work. I mean, this is a, this is a thing. And this, this, a woman once asked me, she said, how do you, you, know, you find the, you know, the, the concentration to work so hard to write your books? I said, like, how do I find the concentration to have sex? I mean, it's, in a way, this concentration, in a, court, in a way, you know, it's hard. You know, but no pun there. Uh, but <laughs> but it's, not, it's, not a, it's, a, it's a thing I love to do. So let me say, Frank. OK. So Okay. Which do you have more fun at, fiction or not? You know, this is another interesting question. The other day, because you know, I wrote this year, you write your novel. It's a book that that the simplistically start today, three hundred sixty-five days later, a novel will be finished. I can't promise you what's going to happen in that novel, but you can you can write it. The other day, I was in between books, and and I thought, you know, one of the terms in that book is the structure of revelation. Talking about plot, I said plot is the structure of revelation when you reveal pertinent information throughout the novel. 
And I thought about that term. I said, you know, that's a very good term. I'm going to write another book that does a much deeper dive into writing fiction called The Elements of Fiction. And it was so much fun writing it. I mean, really, it was so much fun. I had, you know, because I only write three hours a day, I actually had to stop myself. I said, no, Walter, you got to stop. It's three hours. You got to stop. You know, because it was so much fun to do. And of course, you know, if I'm writing about Easy Rollins or Mouse or, I'm, you know, John Woman even, you know, even though it took me so long, I'm, I, I love that. You know, so I, I don't feel that it's a... Um, I, I don't feel it. There are some people that can only write one kind of thing. That's what they love. That's what they're committed to. They're only committed to science fiction. They're only committed to mystery. They're only committed to historical fiction. Well, okay, then that's what they do. But for me, uh, there's, there's different ways to tell different stories. By the way, you've written plays, screenplays. You've helped produce a graphic novel. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll just ask... Uh, uh, Erotica? Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, so you have no bounds. I, I don't. I, I just recently wrote a story that was in Playboy, which is, which is a, a, and it's the one genre I hadn't been able to crack that I wanted to. It was a Western. Hmm. And it was about, and, and it's, it, was a, it, it was like maybe like maybe six months ago. But it was so much fun because I had finally written a Western. It's contemporary and it's New York, but it's definitely a Western. Okay. And it was so much fun. <laughs> Okay, more from the audience, uh, ma'am here, and then, then we'll take the woman next to you. Um, in your Easy Rollins books, there's a true line or a theme of his relationship with the children in his life. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about that, like the choices you made and why? It seems very important to the character. Well, you know, here's the thing. Um, you know, the, the, the noir genre, the, 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 the hard-boiled, and noir and mystery genres, crime novel genres, are actually um, kind of a genre form of existentialism. It's how a person, man or woman, makes a stand for what's right, re regardless of what the law says, regardless of what their safety says, regardless of what the police say, they're going to do what they think is right, even if everybody else thinks it's wrong. The early people, you know, Ross MacDonald, uh, uh, Dashiell Hammett, Raymond Chandler, Kane, all those people, they wrote about detectives who had no mother, no father, no sister, no brother, no uh, regular house, no car. Like, everything was different. Like, every, and every, so, like, if, I, if somebody came up and said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to arrest you, they'd say, okay, because there's nothing. They didn't even have a fish that they got to feed, you know what I mean? <laughs> And, you know, and, and that was wonderful. I mean, th these are great writers, and these, they wrote great books, so I'm not criticizing them. But I think the evolution of it, you know, when it comes up to, like, you know, what I'm doing, what some other people are trying to do, it's, it's harder to be your, committed to your existential reality when you got a child at home, when you got a dog at home, when you have, like, a friend who's old and sick. You know, when you have things in your life that we all have in our lives, and you still have to do the right thing, that becomes much more of a challenge, and that's and that's why. Got a question here? How did you go about finding all of your unpublished works? For example, you just mentioned the Playboy or your Eagles. There's so many other things you've written out here. How did you go about? It? Librarians are really helpful. Honestly, librarians, they, they got all those, like, you know, databases and stuff. They, they, yeah. You just, you just tell them, because, you know, I have, like, listen, I, at least 100 published stories, you know. And, you know, and then my, I have one of my plays is published and, you know, there's, you know, different, different things. And then I have things that are only online, you know. Yeah. That's a good place to start. More questions? Uh, one right here. And I'll get you next. Go ahead. Hi. I think I've read every book except for the science fiction. But I want my I started reading Devil in the Blue Dress. It was probably the first or second book I've ever read when I was a young adult. And so thank you for that. And uh, and I love these drawings. My question I have two questions. Okay. When I was reading John Woman and I'm not finished yet. Um, so now that I hear you talk, um, maybe these are ideas that was a historian and, um, and a scholar. Is that why the, the 
his vocabulary is so broad and his new words. I had to look up some, which I enjoy. Mm -hmm. But I don't remember the, the philosophical part. I can recognize the devil in the blue dress and the, the early book that I read as a young woman. I can recognize the philosophy, but the words weren't so elaborate. Mm -hmm. No. It's the education of the narrator, you know, or the or or, or the, the the who the narrator is closest to. John Woman has spent his entire life reading the most complex books to his father out loud. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, as I said, I started reading as a young woman, and so the characters and for instance, like. There was one in one of the early books where they are in Louisiana or somewhere. I think they go to see this bush woman and Mama Joe. Yeah. Yeah. Mama Joe. Yeah. And they go fishing, but yeah. this mouse being mouse instead of fishing, he puts a shotgun and <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like, even though of course that's insane. But the, no, it works. It, it does work. It works. Work. It works, yeah. yeah. I read it so many years ago. But so how do you do you the when I lived in Vermont, you know, you know, like people, Vermont's the end of the Appalachian Trail. They're poor in Vermont. They're really poor. And they're all white people, but they poor. I mean, they're really poor. It's that, man, I don't have time to get a fishing rod, go out there and put a worm on it. I just, I get my gun with a, you know, with a hollow bullet, shoot the water, and I just collect the fish. That's <laughs> Yeah. 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 Uh, this woman here had a question. Yeah. Uh, my question or my comment is about Fortunate Son, mm -hmm. uh, which is um, my all time favorite. Oh, how nice. Um, for a couple of reasons, but to me, it's, it's a, a very good combination of uh, people and or situations and themes that are surreal to me, mm -hmm. but yet you make the characters completely real, and I believe that all this is possible. Well, you know, it's, it was an interesting thing. I had just made the, the movie Always Outnumbered with the great director, Michael Apted. And Michael has said to me, he says, I want to talk about uh, uh, two brothers, one who's lucky and one who's unlucky. The terminology was bad. Lucky and unlucky, you know, listen, lucky is this. Um, uh, somebody is, the police are breaking in somebody's apartment, so they throw a bag of heroin out the window. And, uh, 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 you know, a, a heroin addict is walking down the street. <laughs> <laughs> and he sees the bag of heroin. And he sees it fall, actually, just like, wow. And he goes, this is my lucky day. <laughs> but his brother, who's standing next to him, said, oh, man, this is the worst day he's ever had in his life. You know, lucky and unlucky is not the thing. So the thing I wanted to do was I wanted to write about fortunate. Like, who was fortunate? The, the black brother is the fortunate son. The, the white brother who has everything also has nothing. And he knows it. And, and, and the black brother also knows it, you know? Which is one of the reasons that women like the thing so much because you see a man's real strength, which is not physical, but which is he will stand up for himself because he knows what's right and what's beautiful. And, and, and so I, I wrote that and Michael said, no, 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 I'm not interested in that. But so then I, you know, I just did the book. <laughs> Uh, I'm afraid we...